and I'm your MC. Um, so before we start, we have many people to thank um, the Monhegan Associates for sponsoring the ecology lectures this year, the ecology committee for organizing the lecture series. We had four lectures, um, including this one. This is the last one of the season. And obviously for Claire Durst for doing amazing technical work behind the scenes, as well as Jess Stevens, who worked hard to get this all to work as well. Thank you. And big thank you to all of you for attending. We appreciate your interest and your participation and your donations are also very much appreciated as a nonprofit, Monhegan Associates is using your dollars to keep our trails wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so tonight, the Monhegan Island water system, past, present, and challenges of the future. Um, this is going to be a conversation with Matthew Rose and Daniel Bates. Daniel Bates, many of you know, um, has lived on Monhegan Island and Manana for decades as, and has been involved with many areas of Monhegan's water system. He was the past head of the Monhegan Water Company uh, field operations, currently a trustee of Monhegan Associates, and in addition, as if that's not enough, a full-time physician on the mainland. <laughs> well, we're happy to Matthew Rose, a water resources scientist, SLR International Corporation, has worked as an environmental scientist and water resources scientist with, um, with them for over seven years, graduated from University of Connecticut with a BS in natural resources, concentrating in water and climate studies. Perfect. His work has focused on soil and water sampling and analysis, surface and groundwater hydrology, potable water system planning and development, brownfield site remediation, and subsurface soil investigations. So, perfect. Especially interested in managing surface and groundwater resources to best balance human and ecological needs. He performed analytical sampling of groundwater during the Monhegan Island study and used computational methods to inform current and future water management on the island. So two experts on the water here, welcome them, thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Um, really appreciate um, Tish and Claire and everyone else for being so welcoming. We've had an incredible day on the island so far. We did a beautiful hike and the weather cleared up for us. And, um, but it's been amazing talking to Dan and learning uh, from him. He's got so much institutional knowledge as far as you know the history of the water system here. So we're gonna start off and he's gonna give us a little bit of uh, historical context for the water system on the island. And then um, I'll follow that up with a little bit of a summary of the study that we did a couple of years ago here. And um, I think we'll tie that together pretty well. It'll be a, a be kind of an interactive thing. So if anyone here has comments or um, something they wanna add to the conversation, feel free. I'd love to, love to hear from all of you since you live here and know a lot more about the island than I do. So, um, but yeah, we'll get started. I'm with Dan, I'll, I'll get the PowerPoint going. Ready? Okay. I'm getting a message that it's kind of hard to hear people okay. unless they are facing the computer. So face the computer, gentlemen. <laughs> Absolutely. Right now, Matt's trying to make it so I can't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, we are ready to go. So okay, this is my laser pointer. <laughs> um, it's pressure treated. I don't know how I'm using it, but it makes me feel like Colonel Clank. Uh, let's see now. Okay, um, we're going back 110 years. Uh, there was a gentleman, Frank Pierce, who was kind of one of the most successful uh, island people, uh, and he got interested in civil engineering. This is when microbial organisms were starting to be truly equated with disease. And he said, you know, we've got all these dug wells all over the island. We've got all of these cesspools all over the island. A cesspool being this basically a pit with a with a um, line to it or, or open uh, outhouses as well. And he wanted to do something about it. So he put out a, uh, a uh, edict uh, 
line your cesspools with concrete and empty them every year. And of course, no one did. Um, there's still some cesspools on the island now. Uh, but he got together with other people and forcibly founded the water company a year later. And by a year from then, they'd actually pushed in the first well points. These are two inch pipe um, and they were brass strainers on the end of pipe that you would add on top of it. And they pointed at the bottom so you could push them down. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the layers you go through the peat, the semi-permeable clay, and then the marine sand and then refusal, which is when you hit bedrock and you can't go any farther. Um, <clears throat> Uh oh. <laughs> All right. No. Yeah, you're really messing me up. You, I'm sorry. No, you're not. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, they they bought a pump. Uh, it was a Myers pump. It was made in Akron, Ohio. Cast one piston going forth, back and forth, pumping water. It was run by a gasoline engine and a leather drive valve. Um, and I'm going to show you a picture. That's actually a smaller version. That one's about 24 inches long. These suckers were about uh, four feet long and two and a half feet high, weighed about 300 pounds, and they cost something a little over $100 back then. And what are you doing here? I am sorry. I'm trying to get it so that. How's that? Oh that God. was good. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. okay. We we are. So they had to decide where to put it. Uh, a lot of the houses, most of the population was located on the near shore, near the wharf, near the, near the beaches and around the meadow. And so they said, well, the meadow looks pretty good. This is what it looked like. This is somewhere in the 30s, I think. These people are all dead now. <laughs> these, these are all school filling kids. You can tell that thing with the sail was actually an ice boat. They, they would resurrect the idea of an ice boat as they went there and it would freeze over. The meadow would fill up with water. This still does most years. And it would freeze over, and there's a lot of skating. If you ever read Ben of Oldman Hagen, they talk about that. And here, uh, this is just a, I'm showing the houses around the meadow. And actually, the the watershed goes from the other side of the main road, really. It goes all the way up to the museum, cuts down like that, all the way to Burnt Head and Bush. And now it actually passed the Southern Firehouse. So there's quite a watershed going into the meadow. And I'm just going to back. From the meadow a little bit, and you can see where it's positioned on the island with the wharf, the beaches, and we'll get back to the beaches in a minute. Um, ice pond, and uh, so anyway, what is the meadow? Well, it's it's vegetation, uh, peat moss, which is really dead sphagnum type mosses. There's little sundews, which are insectivorous plants. The whole plant's about the size of a quarter. There's cattails and other marsh grasses. And the meadow is sort of a, a cross between a bog, which it is when it's very wet, and the peat is actually floating a little bit, and a marsh, which is what it was when it was saltier back, because it used to be a, a saltwater inlet from the beaches coming in, and it slowly isolated and became replaced with fresh water from the watershed, driving the salt water out and lower into the ground. And so you could sink a pipe 20 to uh, 50 feet, depending on where you chose to place it. And that was always hit or miss. And you get four guys on wrenches attached to the pipe, one person turning it around in a circle while the other people just added weight. And very slowly, very quickly, you could get through the peat and very slowly through the marine sand. And you could actually hear, hear the sand grinding as we turned it. It's kind of cool. Um, and then, of course, limited by bedrock. This is, uh, Matt, has, Matt has a much nicer slide. This took me about four hours because I've never done it before. But I just very quickly want to show vegetation, peat moss, which is dead vegetation, clay, which is supposedly impermeable, but really it's semi-permeable. But if there's ducks and muskrats and things uh, leaving their waste up there, at least it protects the aquifer, which is in this marine sand, which used to be continuous with the harbor and then bedrock. And I left those little blue streaks down there for Matt to discuss. Um, this is what a typical water tank was. They bought one, put it up on top of, um, up behind where the museum is now, the lighthouse keeper's house and everything. And there's two tanks up there now. This is the ones that were there when I first uh, was on the island as a child. That's 5,000 gallons. They're made in New York City and New Jersey. The crews in those cities are still putting them up. It takes them about a half a day to put a tank on top of a five, six story building and everything over five stories has to have one because the water pressure in New York won't get any higher. And so these tanks are still available. They last about 25 years. They have to be cleaned out every year by law. And the same crew that builds them will come and clean it. That's actually in California. So I can't find the picture of ours. Okay, I'll slow down now. Um, my, 
tongue is getting wrapped around my eye. Yeah, I've got it over there somewhere. Anyway, <clears throat> they completed those distribution lines in the first couple of years, but here we are 20 years yeah. later. And they gave up the idea of consolidating the sewer lines because another Frank Pierce's ideas was to get one sewer line emptied into the ocean once a year. It never took off. Uh, there's been some uh, revisitation of that over the years until people became more aware of the sewerage problem. 1951, the town took over ownership. It's sort of like a satellite to the town government. It's not actually part of the town government, although that might have changed recently. Um, and by the way, two former water commissioners are in the back row there. So if you hear any heckling, it's them. <laughs> uh, by, by now, as the brass points started to corrode, collapse in on themselves, clog up to a point where they couldn't be cleared again, they were replaced by stainless steel, which is far more durable, far stronger to begin with and lasts longer. And uh, the gasoline engines were newer models. They were a little easier to start, but I can vouch they weren't that easy. And the leather drive belts were replaced by giant fan belts like you have in your car. Three or four of them could go on those wheels. In storage, they added, they'd already added another wooden tank. So we we're up to 10,000 gallons at that point. Uh, and this, this is a sidebar. Uh, people were worried about fire prevention. Um, we could drain those tanks in a couple hours with fire truck. And so they said, well, let's use the ice pond. If we have a fire, we can fill up from the ice pond. Yeah, sure, but it's only two, three feet deep. And uh, so Ferdinand Day, his nickname was Dent. Uh, he was my first boss out here ever. He said, well, you know, you've got all of long swamp full of water. How about we blow a trench over to the road and then siphon water down into the ice pond whenever we need it? And this was in the mid 50s. It's a great idea. They had a, a crew come out here, some contractors with dynamite, and they actually blew that entire canal that goes along the Blackhead Road as you start getting into the woods. That whole, that was all blown out with dynamite. One blast, the whole strip. And Bob Burton was actually here back then. He remembers watching it as in awe. Um, and, um, but it failed, and why did it fail? Anyone who's ever you know, siphoned gas out of a police cruiser in the middle of the night <laughs> knows that you have, a, you have your tube and you make sure that it's in the high spot, which would be the gas tank, and you have a lower spot. And the difference in um, height is difference in mass. And that draws the fluid up through from the low spot up over a hump, which in this case would be the road, and down into the other side. The problem is if you get one bubble in there, you have to start all over. And if it's gasoline, you're going to have it in your lungs. The, uh, the, they used a four inch pipe, big mistake. It's beautiful stuff. Uh, it's still there, a lot of it. I'd salvage it a little bit for my own use. Um, it's galvanized four inch steel pipe threaded together. And you can see the remnants there crossing the road on either side of the road. It, um, because it sucked the water so fast, having that large bore diameter, it immediately would get air and it wouldn't work. And they had to abandon the whole, pro the whole project immediately. It just wasn't going to work. And just like Seward and Seward's Folly when you bought Alaska, they started calling it Dinty's Ditch, which was <laughs> unbelievably cruel. I, I was bothered when I first heard that, but I couldn't resist. Uh, louder yet? Okay. Anyway, I thought it was being obnoxiously loud. Um, in the 60s, uh, by then, the stainless steel tanks started appearing when, it, when they replaced one of the wooden tanks. They shipped out a 17, I think it's 17,500. I might be wrong about that tank it somehow got it up the hill it's on concrete bed up there and they did that and then they doubled it when they installed a second tank when the second wooden tank failed chlorination was done by estimation you take sodium hypochlorite which is triple strength clorox um it's amazingly toxic stuff and it came in five gallon things and they take a gallon of it up the ladder on the tank, which I think I can show you. There's a couple, there's the two tanks that are there now. And you climb up the ladder and pour in about a gallon of that stuff, mm -hmm. and then go back down the hill and open a tap and taste it. It seemed a little chlorinated. You figured you were okay, but uh, it wasn't scientific. It wouldn't have passed a state inspection, which hadn't started yet. And, and the other thing is there was a building boom on the island, the whole Mostel area, parts of Dead Man's Cove, parts of other areas of the island had more houses being, in fact, the ice pond had a big house built on it uh, too. And um, water usage was going up and you could, they, it, the people were starting to worry about it. And it was in a lot of discussions in some publications even. Um, 
also, people were always asking me about the red color. They'd ask everybody, even before I was born, why is this water red? And if you take a glass of unchlorinated water and put it in a warm place in the sun, it will turn very, very dark orange within an hour. And there'll be little gobs of jelly in the bottom. It looks like frog eggs, and they're not. They're actually colonies of iron bacteria. Iron bacteria is totally harmless. You could drink them, frog eggs and all, and you wouldn't be harmed. But the uh, cosmetic problem is terrific. And people were always complaining. You wash your sheets, they come out <laughs> orange. You bleach them, it fixes the, the, the <laughs> rust in the sheets so you'll never get it out. And everybody, of course, tried bleaching first. Uh, there's one guy out here who I won't name who used to give everybody trouble every year about that. And the shortages, as I said, were being, I just want to use this, were, were being um, increased. The tanks have a hatch at the bottom, both of them. And you can crawl in there and swab it out in the fall when we empty the system, because I didn't mention it, but the system is seasonal because all the pipes are above ground here because we don't have any water. I mean, we don't have any topsoil to speak of. And, uh, and of course the tops you can get into as well if you need to put stuff in like the chlorine used to be. So then we go to the 1970s, I hope. Oh no, okay, this is another sidebar, forgive me everyone. Um, in the Azores, uh, in the 1970s, the, the naval station, the American naval station was in the Azores, very arid islands, only seasonal water supplies from the sky. And the Navy station said, hey, we can, we can be friends with the natives and have more water for ourselves, so we'll put in a desalinization pit. That is one of the pits that has salt water in it. And with a great input of electricity, you can desalinize water with reverse osmosis, um, which I'm not gonna explain right now for two reasons. Uh, one is I can't remember how it works, but <laughs> the people, but the Naval Station started using more water. They had oodles of water now, it was like magnitudes more, six, seven, I can't remember the exact number, times as much water as they had. And within just a few years, a, a little over half a decade, they were running out of water again. Because if you have more water or if you have more electricity, people use it. Uh, Gardens, uh, lawns, showers. Palm Olive and Johnson and Johnson invented the daily shower. That used to be once a week. And then with TV and ads, people were convinced they had to shower every day. Um, and by the way, I just got water in Manana, running water for the first time in 40 years. <laughs> anyway, so we, we have a crisis every year, pretty much. Maybe not this year, we can hope. But then came the 70s, and so this is when I came on board. Vernon Burton was the water commissioner. He hired and trained uh, Paul Horn. Paul hired me, $3 an hour. I talked him up to five. And, uh, and then we brought Billy Boynton on board. And uh, the three of us got a visit from the Maine Rural Water Commission who pressured us rather seriously into joining. They were a new organization, they needed members, but they were very, very helpful. They sent me to South Booth Bay, where there was a brand new water system that had been completely modernized. And anyway, we, we took this, the helter-skelter suction lines from the well points to the pumps, which are in a pump house at the side of the meadow. We took those and we made a manifold system so we could isolate each well point and test it for air leaks, test it for clogging, and only keep the good ones, remove the old ones, and put in new well points whenever we needed to, or back flush ones that were clogged by pumping water in the reverse direction. Um, <clears throat> The old pumps were replaced by uh, two smaller pumps of the same exact design, same patents, but a different company had bought the patent. And even though they were smaller, they could put out uh, 300, 400 gallons on a good day if there's not too much resistance. And two of them together could put out 400 to 600 gallons. And thank you, Matt, for that figure. I uh, couldn't remember myself. And um, so we were getting more water. This is actually one of the pumps that's pumping as we speak. It looks awful. Um, but you can see this is that reciprocating cylinder that's actually pushing the water up through a valve system and then out the water. This is the suction line coming in. That's an air chamber that you fill to prime it. Electric motor, belts on the other side going to a, a eccentric pulley, which drives that shaft back and forth like any of the pump. Even though they look awful on the outside, you open one up to service, it is absolutely pristine inside. It is so clean and so such beautiful machinery. Um, and we were driving more well points, replacing the old ones. Uh, it was overdue. The gasoline engines were replaced by electric motors. Bob Burton for the Island Inn had some generators there. We borrowed some of his power and then the town got electrified and we had it all the time we were on from spring to fall. And we got a little chlorine pump which operated the system. It squirts, it injects a little bit of chlorine 
in a pulsed fashion at the bottom of the hill, right behind the pumps when the pumps are on, chlorine is being injected and it all gets mixed on the way up the hill to the towers, to the standing standpipes or tanks. And um, then we test the amount of chlorine and we also send a water sample to the state monthly to uh, make sure that the bacteria count is minimal. The other upgrade, and this is the one, this is the only thing in my life I'm proud of, is there, <laughs> I'm serious, uh, is um, there, there, there were six different sizes of pipe, three quarter inch, one, one and a quarter, one and a half, two inch, three inch pipe. Uh, and there were many different materials, iron pipe, which was the original, galvanized steel pipe, which is what was there when I was there. One commissioner uh, tried gluing PVC, which is the stuff under your sinks. Uh, it was a higher, higher, a th thicker PVC called Schedule 80. That stuff would explode every winter. A few drops of water in there, and it would, and it, if it froze, it would explode. A lawnmower would break it, a truck tire would break it. None, none of the PVC lasted more than a year, which was a shame because it went together in seconds. Um, and then black polyethylene, like you see at Home Depot with the little stainless steel clamps, only we had a more sophisticated clamping system, which worked very well. But, but it was ridiculous. You go looking for a part, and this is what you would see. <laughs> I, and that would be the back of a truck or the middle of the pump house. There were nine different sizes and, and materials at one time on the island. And so I got it down to two sizes, three inch and two inch. This isn't about me. This is about me and Willard at this point. <laughs> Willard was doing this. Um, three inch loop coming down from the tanks on either side of the tanks around the meadow. One spur out part way towards the ice pond, one spur out part way to a uh, lobster cove, and then some two inch spurs coming off that. It's put together with a plastic welder, which is, looks about the same as a Honda generator. You clamp the pipe ends in it, and with levers, you squeeze the two against a cutter that cuts them so they're perfectly flush. Then you take that out, put in a heating element, which is Teflon coated plate, about an inch thick, squeeze it again until the ends get moist, the plastic gets moist. Take that out and then you quickly squeeze them together and you get a perfect, neat, aesthetically pleasing to me, weld, which is stronger than the original material on either side of it. It's beautiful material. It surpassed all of our expectations. This is a T and you can see the little uh, wells. That's a weld, that's a weld, that's a weld, that's one fitting. That's an adapter down to two inches, not a weld. And I could have done that assembly right there probably in about 15 minutes or 20 minutes if I were in position. That's how easy it was, and it's 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 dinosaur proof. It's amazing. Uh, this is how it's connected for the services to your houses. It's a clamp-on stainless steel, I believe, van. And once it's on, this could be a fully charged water pipe with pressure in it. And then you carefully step back and drill a hole where that is, and as quickly as you can, screw a fitting in, which would be a valve. Turn off the valve, dry yourself off, and you're all and you're all set. You can you can work with it. You can hook it up to any house. And each of your houses has that. That goes to a meter, a shutoff valve, then a meter, or the other way around. And that's been a wonderful system because if you have an emergency, you can put one of those right over a leak. Um, and that's where we are today. Uh, if there's nothing I haven't, if there's anything I haven't covered, um, I'll be here at the end, and Matt and I will be open to questions when we finish. I'm going to hand it over to him because uh, it's not so much as when the well runs dry, it's when the water quality changes. What are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And Matt has great slides, so stay tuned. Thank you. Okay. So this guy first, and then. Team? Are you seeing that? No, you're seeing me. Okay. Yep. We could be very very younger. Slide. Yes. Um, Perfect. Are you still getting my? Oh no! Yeah, right? I'm still getting it. Sorry. Let's try one more time. Let's try this one. Yeah, it's got the notes, but it's okay. <laughs> hmm, what happened? Hang on one second.
Nope. I'm just so perfect. Anybody know anything else? I know, please. Okay, got it. We got it. Got it. Okay. 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 Thank God. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate it. I mean, that was uh, a, a really great review of, of the past of and the present of the water system here. So we kind of titled this talk, The Past, the Present, and the Challenges of the Future. And I think Dan did a great job um, leading us about halfway, you know, to, to the present. And so I think I'll take it from the present and try and talk a little bit about um, what we're looking at in, in the future. So I wanted to start off with some groundwater basics. And um, I'm sorry if this is insulting anyone's intelligence here. They may be very familiar or or sorry that if this is too technical for anyone here. It, hopefully we're somewhere in between. Um, I wanted to start off with the concept of what is an aquifer. So an aquifer as I'm kind of defining it here, it's some sort of a geological formation, whether it be rock or whether it be sand and gravel or whether it be soap or some other material that holds water, groundwater specifically. So on Monhegan Island, we can kind of think of the, uh, we can kind of think of three separate, three separate aquifers as coming into play as far as where water is sourced from. So. We have old dug wells on the island, which probably date back to the 1800s or, or earlier in some cases. And so um, you can see on the left here, that's okay. The that's okay. The dug wells on the left are dug into what's called glacial till. So that's okay. Thank you. Um, so glacial till is essentially a mix of fine sand and silt and other materials that's been deposited by glaciers. And it's it's typically very thin on the island. If you if you imagine, if you were trying to dig a deep hole somewhere on the island, I think you would probably run into bedrock pretty quickly. Um, that layer is very thin, but there are some areas of the island where there's been enough of this material deposited where you can, you can dig a well. Um, the next uh, uh, aquifer is the kind of sand and gravel overburden aquifer. So that is uh, that would describe the meadow. Essentially, the meadow was formed when there was a bedrock depression, and then these what's called glacial marine sands filled that depression. And then on top of that, and I'll show you, I'll get to this in a little more detail after. Um, I, on top of that, we have a peat and in top soil and other materials. No. You... Oh. Okay. Put your hand up. Now. Okay. okay. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, so, <laughs> um, so the third, the third uh, aquifer on the island is uh, the bedrock aquifer. So we've drilled plenty of bedrock wells in the in the um, on the island, typically for year-round usage, and they're tapping into essentially the um, fractures in the bedrock. Um, so we'll get into that. A little bit more later too, but I just wanted to give an overview, and you can see the examples there on the left. We have our dug wells, kind of in the center. That would be I'll point to here. That would be like the meadow there, and then our bedrock wells, drilled bedrock well, extending into that bedrock formation. So we have all three on the island. So um, obviously the sand and gravel aquifer is bearing the brunt of the water supply load at this point in time. Um, but as we'll get into, the point of the study that we did was to determine if perhaps the bedrock aquifer uh, could be used to supplement that supply. So again, glacial till aquifer. We have an example of a dug well. I'm sorry if this is someone's yard here. We were uh, we were going about the island and uh, taking pictures as we went uh, when we did the study. So we got some really cool examples of of, of different um, wells. But again, uh, a dug well essentially water is collected from the glacial till, which is sitting on the bedrock. Typically, these wells are not super productive. Glacial till is a fine material. There's not a lot of space in between the grains of the materials. So if you can imagine rocks sitting against each other, there's space in between the rocks. We call that like the pore space or the void space and water fills that space. So when you have very fine grain materials like uh, silt and fine sand, um, you don't get a lot of space for water to, uh, to, to store in. So 
Um, typically, you don't get a lot of water, a lot of a lot of water out of these wells, and a lot of times there's contamination issues too because the wells are not always, you know, they're old. Um, there's um, runoff from animal waste, whatever spiders and bugs can get in the well, whatever. So we have some contamination concerns sometimes with these older um, dug wells, but many of them are functional and still provide water to this day. Um, what kind of depth do you Oh, perfect. Yeah. So typically dug wells are, you know, 20 feet or less. Right. You know, people are digging these big trenches back in the day by hand and then and then using stone masonry or maybe concrete caissons to to create a well bore. So when you think of your traditional wishing well or something like that that you would lower a bucket into, you know, that's a dug well. That's what we're talking about. That's dug into the glacial till that's sitting on top of the bedrock. So then we have the um, the sand and gravel aquifer for the meadow. Um, so this is a really cool schematic from the from the Timpson report, and I'm kind of jealous of Dan's uh, hand drawn meadow. Uh, I, I think that was a very impressive, and and sh and I like the coloring. Um, but <laughs> this is a black and white version, but it does show some scale, which is kind of interesting. So. This is kind of a cross section of the meadow, so you can imagine if you were able to um, stand and look at the meadow from, you know, a, a cross section. You're staring at the side of it. So, this is showing your bedrock depression, your natural bedrock depression, which was, you know, formed with the creation of the island and and by uh, the glaciers retreating as well. We worked this area, and I'll just kind of um, circle that for the people that are um, watching online. So, this is our bedrock. Um, around the bottom and then this filled in with sand it washed in over time and then on top of that we have lacustrine clay lacustrine clay is formed when a ponding environment occurs on top of the sand so what likely happened is that the meadow is still some sort it's just a bowl and it was probably more of a pond going back thousands and thousands of years and each year that deposited material um which uh you know, with dead animal and plant matter, and that forms that lacustrian clay. And that's speculation. I'm not exactly sure of the, you know, the the, the geologic or origins, but often when we see lacustrian clay, that's due to some sort of a prolonged period of ponding. And now we have peat and vegetation on top um, because um, it's gotten closer and closer to the surface. And you know, there's uh, the ability for vegetation to to grow and to um, to form that peat layer. So. The way the aquifer, um, the, the aquifer of the meadow works is a little bit interesting because rainwater falls down onto this peat layer and it actually doesn't permeate that peat layer very well because peat is another example of a material with very, very small pore spaces. It doesn't allow water through very easily. So most of the water that comes into the meadow via rainfall is probably entering more towards the sides here where this peat layer is very thin and in some cases it may even it may even be some sand extending in, but this aquifer is also recharged by the bedrock, which we'll get into in a second. So there's actually fissures in the bedrock that are allowing water to flow through those cracks, basically into that sand aquifer. And then, as Dan showed us, um, the aquifer is tapped by using these these well points, which are essentially steel screened well points that are driven through this peat and lacustrine clay layer into the sand. And so they're able to take advantage of that pore space within the sand. And then a vacuum pump, as we saw, draws that water out into the system. And then the rest is, is uh, you know, um, evident with the, the tanks and, you know, the water system as we can see it above ground. So as I understand it right now, the meadow seems to provide the majority of the island's drinking water, especially during during the summer months, but it's a seasonal system. Um, so um, that's where we get into our bedrock aquifer. So on the island, we have numerous bedrock wells, even walking today, I'm, you know, we're supposed to be looking at the scenery, admiring everything, and I'm just seeing all the wells here and there. You know, uh, and it uh, essentially these wells are intersecting Again, these bedrock fractures. Um, the wells can be 200 feet deep, 300 feet deep, 500 feet deep, sometimes even deeper. Um, they're drilled with a giant drill rig. They're going right through that overburden layer, that glacial till that we talked about. They're sealed off. And then there's a drill bit that extends down into the bedrock. And usually the water is pumped uh, to the surface by using what's called a vertical turbine, or sorry, a, um, a submersible pump, um, which uh, is descended down way into the well bore and pumps water up 
to the surface. And that water um, is uh, able to um, you know, provide service year round because there's usually a pipe that comes out somewhere underground and will go right up into the house. And you don't have to worry about, uh, you don't have to worry about pipes freezing. Um, bedrock wells usually don't yield a lot of water, but it's usually plenty for at least an individual house. Um, but some wells are, are pretty productive. Sometimes you can get close to 10 gallons a minute, which is probably on the order of what the meadow may be putting out. And it could be a little bit more than that, but um, these wells are variable in their output. But um, the advantage is that they can uh, um, provide this year round water service. And typically bedrock wells are, are less impacted by some of the contamination, um, like the surface contamination, whether it be E. coli from runoff or from septic systems. Um, that's not a given, but that is typically the case. So some general risks to uh, the island's water. Um, I, I put a couple of, of, of risks here and some of them, you know, the cemetery is technically a, a contamination risk, probably not a huge risk, but I thought it would be um, fun to include it is, it is, let's say you wouldn't want to drill your well right there uh, for the cemetery, I would not recommend that. Um, but you know, fuel leaks from generators, heating well tanks, vehicles, um, it's it's a real issue. Um, I know it's happened on the island in the past. There have been fuel oil leaks. Fortunately, it seems like the island's moved away um, from from fuel oil uh, in most cases. I see a lot of propane uh, propane tanks and hopefully um, maybe solar someday, whatever. I think that will be less of a problem going forward, but it has been a problem in the past. Um, Coliform bacteria, major issue um, that can impact uh, the meadow. Uh, you know, if you have failing septic systems, if you have animal waste runoff, it's all going to end up in that depression there. And it's not a given that it's going to cause issues, but it's just it, it's a potential source of contamination. And coliform bacteria can also impact dug wells, can impact bedrock wells. Um, but it's something that we keep an eye on because obviously that can can lead to illness. Um, firefighting, firefighting foams are a, a emerging contaminant source. Um, you might be hearing a lot about PFAS, um, which is a chemical mm -hmm. used in uh, Teflon. It's used in firefighting foams. It's a long chain of fluorine atoms, which is very, very resilient to biodegradation. Um, these chemicals stick around and they're linking them to all sorts of um, endocrine issues and, and cancer. And it's yet to be seen what the full impact of those um, effects are. But it's something we should be aware of um, that, and fortunately, when we were on the island, we actually checked the firefighting foams that are here and they do not appear to contain PFAS, which is a really good sign. How do you spell it? PFAS is P-F-A-S. It's an acronym. What um, does that stand for? It's perfluoroalkyl substances, I believe. So perfluoro just meaning long chains of fluorine atoms bonded together. Um, and then lastly, saltwater intrusion. Um, I wrote intrusion or inundation because the meadow aquifer, um, I know there's concern with water overtopping by Swim Beach, um, as well as potential saltwater intrusion, which is water, saltwater migrating through the aquifer beneath the surface. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more in just a second. Taylor, would you mind having the charger? Like the battery's running really well, thanks. Um, so what is saltwater intrusion? So saltwater intrusion in the context of potable water it means saltwater has impacted, has entered the groundwater aquifer to the extent that it's causing issues with drinking water. It's causing um, palatability issues, meaning it tastes bad. It's causing um, unacceptable levels of, of salt related chemicals in the water, which is, you know, could potentially be linked to health effects. Thanks. Perfect. Uh-oh, I'm sorry. Um, so saltwater intrusion is a, is a little bit, a little bit of a tricky topic because it, um, the way it works is that the water is pumped out of the ground and it causes what's called a cone of depression. You can see that right here. This is the fresh water. And this, it, when you pump water out of the ground, it creates this cone of depression. And salt water, if, if you imagine this 
continuing to drop and drop and drop. Eventually, salt water can actually make its way, creates a gradient, and salt water can make its way into the well bore. And once the salt water has made its way through, it's 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 damaged that section of the aquifer. It's not easy to recover from that. It can take a lot of time because you can imagine the salt water is deposited these chemicals all throughout all throughout the aquifer. And by these chemicals, I mean sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride. These are all constituents of salt water. So we really want to avoid this issue. It's not a matter of, you know, we we uh, introduce salt water into the well once and then it goes away and it's never a problem. Sometimes it can be a persistent problem. So we really want to avoid this, this situation. Um, so uh, let me continue. Sorry, this is these are a little bit technical slides, but the way saltwater intrusion um, is kind of modeled is, so you can imagine if this is the island right here, and let me just show online for everyone. This is our island right here. This is our, our what's called a freshwater lens. And so the way fresh water is stored in the aquifers of the island, whether it's the bedrock aquifer or the meadow um, or in the till, is the rain falls on the surface and it builds up this, this lens. So if you can imagine, so this is sea level right here. The fresh water actually goes up like this and it displaces the salt water below it. It's, it's kind of like a boat, like a ship displacing water. If anything buoyant displaces water. And it's modeled by this equation called the geibner hersberg uh, principle. And essentially what it tells us is that the distance of fresh water beneath sea level is a, approximately 40 times the distance of fresh water above sea level at any given point. So for example, if at this point it was 10 feet of fresh water here, we can expect that there would be 400 feet of fresh water descending below the surface. So if there were 100 feet here, We'd have 4,000 feet of, of fresh water beneath the surface. It's not a, a, a rule, a hard and fast rule, but it's an estimation of, of how deep that fresh water descends below the surface. So, with all that background information, and I'm sorry if that was a lot, we did a study in 2020, um, 2019, 2020 where we looked at um, the aquifers on the island and we assessed the risk of saltwater intrusion. And um, we looked at the future potential of using the bedrock aquifer. And this was funded by um, the Maine Coastal Program, NOAA, a few other state agencies. And um, Mylona McBroom is our old company. I work for SLR now. We used to be known as Mylona McBroom. We've been acquired since then. But um, regardless, we did this study to um, to take a look at the water supply in the island. And I'll give you a brief rundown of the, of the results. So objectives, characterization of the meadow aquifer. We wanted to evaluate the risk of saltwater intrusion to the meadow itself, since that's the largest supply source. We wanted to characterize the bedrock aquifer um, on the island, kind of see how it's being used at this moment. And then we wanted to explore how the bedrock aquifer might be used in the future to augment the meadow aquifer and potentially replace it someday, maybe, or maybe not. Uh, we just wanted to um, explore all of these options. So just as a little bit of background. So uh, I came to the island in 2019 and um, Andrew was gracious enough to uh, accommodate us. And we went uh, around the island and we, we sampled uh, water from the meadow. We sampled water from a variety of wells. Um, and we did a series of analyses on the water and um, I think I'll get into a little bit more in the subsequent slides, but um, but it was a really interesting opportunity to to actually look at the water quality um, firsthand and kind of see if we're seeing these effects of saltwater intrusion um, and and kind of identify the potential of these aquifers uh, going forward. So. Objective one, so characterization of the meadow aquifer. So the first thing we did, uh, my colleague Scott actually ran a model to determine how vulnerable the meadow aquifer is to saltwater intrusion. So he used a program called ModFlow 2000. And essentially what this program does is it traces the aquifer, which you can see um, with this red boundary here. Um, he applies a bunch of uh, constraining conditions, which I won't bore you with. And essentially the goal is to determine if we, continue to withdraw 
uh, water from the meadow aquifer as we have been doing at approximately the rates that we've been withdrawing, what is the likelihood uh, at the present and in the future that we would be dealing with saltwater intrusion, meaning saltwater is going to migrate beneath the subsurface and, and contaminate the aquifer. And long story short, he found it was unlikely that we would see direct impacts from saltwater intrusion in the meadow aquifer. Now, this he modeled uh, one to three feet of sea level rise to account for potential uh, potential sea level rise in the future. So, I believe the the I believe the state of Maine has determined that by 2050 we could be looking at a foot and a half of sea level rise in this area, and by 2100 close to three feet. So this would be kind of like a 2100 projection. And so he found that it's unlikely that in uh, that saltwater intrusion specifically would be a major threat. However, sea level rise also introduces the, the, uh, the problem of overtopping and inundation of the meadow aquifer as well. So I think uh, Dan has mentioned in the past, the meadow has been flooded occasionally. I, it doesn't sound like it's something that happens often, but um, that is a risk to the meadow over time. If that inundation keeps happening continuously, um, it could affect the water quality. Fortunately, that layer of heat provide some protection and actually can can buffer that and can send that and that water will accumulate on top and eventually drain um, out of the meadow, but we don't want continued inundation events. So um, long story short, the meadow currently does not appear to be at a very high risk of saltwater intrusion, but over time as sea level rises, we could see more frequent uh, inundation events. And unfortunately the inundation part of that was not a huge object. It wasn't a, a major part of this study. We didn't study that to the degree that you would need to really characterize that risk going forward, but it is something that we acknowledged uh, uh, could be a problem going forward. Um, so objective two of the, the uh, project was characterization of the bedrock aquifer. So again, I've kind of covered this. The bedrock aquifer um, you can use a series of drilled wells to intersect these fractures. You can see the fractures on the surface of, of the rock on this graphic. And um, basically, we wanted to determine, is saltwater intrusion impacting the wells currently on the island? Um, so we went around um, and we took depth to water measurements um, and we applied that to that guyben herzberg equation that I talked about earlier, that 40 foot for every foot equation, essentially. And we uh, use that to determine how deep the fresh water was at any location. And, we, and I'll show you, I have a map of the wells that we looked at in just a moment. So we also ran a series of field tests. We used a multi-parameter probe to look for conductivity in the water of the wells. So what that means is, um, if the wells were showing high levels of conductivity, that means that potentially salt water will have made its way into the well. That's, that's at one indicator of salt water intrusion. And then lastly, we used analytical tests. We actually sampled water from as many wells as we could. And we sent that to a lab and I can't remember which uh, city it was, but we sent it to a local lab and they analyzed it for chloride. And again, chloride is the common denominator of the variety of salts I mentioned earlier, magnesium, potassium, sodium, chloride. These are all constituents of salt water. So the thinking was, if we found chloride in the wells, that means that salt water has been making its way into that well. It might not be at a level that's detectable, but that would give us a sense of if the well was impacted or not. And then total suspended solids, just another indicator potentially of salt water intrusion. So these are the wells that we we monitored. We we don't have we didn't have like specific. This is just kind of the names of the people's houses that we went to. It's kind of funny. Um, but uh, um, so we went to sixteen bedrock wells. We took the field measurements as I described. We took the analytical measurements um, when we could, if the water was on. We compared them to these criteria um, to the bottom right of the screen. So the EPA actually has a standard for chloride and total dissolved solids. Um, they have a what's called a reference standard, which is not a necessarily um, like a, a hard and fast criteria, but it's kind of a recommended standard for conductivity and salinity. And we compared the results to the EPA guidance. And what we found is that none of the wells 
on the island actually exceeded any of these. Um, we did get close at a couple of the wells along the shore, uh, right along the coast. And um, I won't call out any wells in particular, but some of the wells along the coast were, were close. Um, and then when we used that guy Van Herzberg equation, we did find that some of the wells directly along the coast potentially don't have a huge lens of fresh water beneath them. So there might be a little bit of a risk there, not at, not in an acute risk. Again, we didn't see any any grossly um, elevated numbers, but you know, just a reminder that the wells closest, or a kind of a uh, an indicator that the wells closest to the coast could be could be at some risk of saltwater intrusion, um, but not levels that were um, that were out of out of the EPA reference ranges at this point. The limitations of the study though, unfortunately, were that we took these samples during the off season in November when we were there. So it would be really nice to see, it'd be nice to take these samples um, kind of in season now when the wells are being used a little bit more heavily because that draws more heavily from the aquifer. It creates more of that cone of depression. If you remember I talked about earlier where it draws the fresh water down. And so um, I, I think there were some limitations to the data that we, collected, um, but the initial results of the work that we did was, was promising in that regard. So objective three um, was kind of exploration of the bedrock aquifer as a future source. So meaning, can we drill more wells? Can we expand the, can we expand our use of this aquifer to supplement the meadow and potentially, you know, have it as a backup? or potentially replace the meadow if we needed to in the future. So we looked at a few different parameters in order to make that determination. So we looked at places you could put wells on the island um, based on you know, uh, distance to contamination sources, which is, which is based on main uh, regulations regarding setbacks. We looked at things like infrastructure costs, like it wouldn't make sense to put a well you know, way on the north or the south of the island and then have to trench, you know, like thousands of feet to the water tanks that just isn't really realistic at this point. And then of course, property ownership, you, you probably, if you own property here, you might not like the idea of a giant drill rig um, ripping up your yard to drill a public water system well, and you likely have a septic system that's too close to that well anyway, so it would create issues with setbacks. So we took a look at a few locations on the island just as a, you know, kind of a hypothetical um, so this, uh, this map actually shows all of the sanitary setback issues. This shows all of the places where we had a, a potential conflict with contamination sources. So those are all the septic, those uh, bullseyes represent either septic systems or um, I think like the dumpsters are on there, um, transformers, you know, whatever, some random suspicious area that maybe was a garbage pile or something. I don't know, whatever we kind of identified in the field as somewhere where we might not want to put a well near. And so we came up with a few locations where it, it might be interesting to explore um, putting a well. And I'm sure many of you can think of better locations than we came up with, but um, and I'd be more than happy to hear those too. Um, or, or you can maybe think of reasons why these areas wouldn't work. But anyway, these were just some preliminary thoughts from from the uh, from the study. So um, we looked at one location off of Whitehead Trail, um, kind of near the dumpsters, but far enough away that we were outside those setbacks. Um, again, that's way up on the hill, so we're not worried about saltwater intrusion there. More than likely, we have a huge freshwater lens, not terribly far from the tanks, um, from the water tanks. That is, um, so again, extremely low risk of saltwater intrusion. Uh, upgrade, it would be actually upgrading of the power station, so we wouldn't have to worry about contamination from that location. Um, and, um, you know, uh, no private properties would necessarily, uh, and by private, I mean outside of the um, Monhegan Island Associates land, uh, would need to be crossed in order to trench to the, to the tanks. Um, so that's one location we thought might be interesting to explore. The cons of that area, um, it's way up on the hill, so yield can be unreliable. Um, sometimes you drill a well way up on a hill and you actually get really good water because you're kind of intersecting that whole bedrock interface. Other times um, they're kind of poorly yielding wells up in that area because gravity is working against you in a way it's pushing water towards the coast. So it, it, it's variable, but it's an interesting 
place that. Uh, yes. Could you point with that stick? Yes, I can. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. So it's this little black box. Sorry, I did not call that out. Yep. What's so that's, that? That is the potential well location. That's an okay. area. That's an area that may work for for a potential public and water system well. So that's off of the Whitehead Trail, okay. about four so about four hundred feet east of there. Um, so that's one location that may work. Um, we looked at another location. This would require more land clearing. It's a little bit more vegetated. Um, this is kind of uh, um, a little bit to the north of the power station. Um, this area may be a little bit less appealing uh, because of its distance from the uh, from the uh, water tanks. It would require a pretty good trench through the woods, or if you were to kind of follow the roadway, it would require 1,500 feet of trenching. So, um, and and when I uh, refer to trenching, I'm assuming that you we would want these as a, a year-round water supply um, because, and I see some head shaking back there. If it was to be a seasonal water supply, you would not have to trench. Um, um, so that is uh, a second location that might be viable. A third location, this is um, kind of threading the needle here. This is not terribly far um, from the tanks. It's a little bit to the uh, east of the Mithra well. Um, you might run into some issues with setbacks, um, but again, um, you know, that's another option that could be considered. And then a fourth option, this one appears to be a really bad option, and I'll point it out because it looks like it's right there, but we kind of argued that um, maybe because the light, I think it's the Lighthouse Museum, I, I, it, whatever septic system that is intersecting, we felt like could probably argue that it's not a, a high risk contamination source, and all these setbacks are subject to interpretation by the main regulators, so you could potentially make a case that you wouldn't have to follow them. So um, those are just some options that we came up with. Um, they're basically all, all up, right? Around. They, they're all up kind of off, um, just going up towards the, basically going up towards the power station off the road to the, to the left and the right, going up. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure yeah, where it is relative to it. Um, so again, you may all have some really good um, alternatives in mind that could could be potential sources as well. And, and I'd love to hear them. outside that red area is, is unviable because it's too much topography to have to car through in order to get the water into the I think so. It would be a lot of work to it'd be. It'd be a lot of land clearing. It'd be a lot of topography. It'd be a, to to overcome. And, and then, of course, along the coastline, you're dealing with just the, the sheer amount of development and setback issues. Um, so we kind of use that large parcel as a, a, a you know, the Monhegan Island um, Associates parcel is kind of like a, a baseline, a guideline. I mean, yes, you could conceivably drill a well somewhere way up north um, or way to the south, but it's it's probably not feasible. Um, Maybe explain some quote what people are saying. So yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yes. I, I don't know if people can know this. Uh, it may be Danny to be able to talk about there, there were there were uh, drills that came out um, in the fall, last fall, to see about drilling um, some wells for the for the town. Are those areas that we're looking at described? Is that where the hope of where those wells would have been drilled? Yes, the uh, first one I believe didn't show three four slide back. First one was square. Well, that was one of the one of the select areas in the Higgins Associates is I believe, and please don't quote me this, I don't want to be shot. And I believe um that they have said that they would go along with three wells in that area. And so so Matt, what um I don't know if there are Yeah, yeah, I can repeat that. There, that little last square could accommodate more than one well. Um you'd have yeah, I, I don't I don't know offhand exactly how large that square is. Um, you'd probably be able to get away with a well maybe in this area and in this area. You'd want like some decent separation between them, but yeah, prob probably you could you could probably do a couple of wells in this area. It would be you'd have to it'd have to study it further, I think, to see how much it could accommodate. The second question is: since this was done in 2020, I think about 15 more wells have been drilled. Oh wow! Okay. 
Did that make any difference at all to the calculation phase? Yeah, yeah. And just to repeat that question, the, the question is whether um, there's been additional wells, 15 additional wells drilled in the last couple of years. Would that affect um, you know the the calculations that we did in the study? Um, it, it it could. Um, if the wells, I mean, it would be nice to have data from those wells. I'd be curious where those wells were drilled in proximity to the ones that we did study. Um, you know, as I kind of alluded to before, if you're withdrawing very heavily from any one area, you create a stronger cone of depression. And it's conceivable that you would increase saltwater intrusion risk in that area. So if those wells are um, in areas that were already maybe a higher risk area, uh, yeah, it, it could it could change it. It would be really interesting to have more data from those wells. But that's what, and that's what I, I should emphasize and should have emphasized that the data we collected was limited to the wells that we went to, you know, so we didn't go to every well, we didn't sample every well. Um, again, we didn't see concerning results in any of the wells that we did sample, but that's not necessarily guarantee that any well that we could sample would, wouldn't have issues. Yes, question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So when you say use, it's not correct technically. Yes, it's, yes, yes. In yes. Quoted to the yeah. So the question was uh, municipally owned land. Um, essentially, municipally owned land is incorrect. I should have written Monhegan Island Associates owned land. But the thinking was that the land, we wouldn't be drilling wells in people's backyards, essentially. We'd be drilling wells in a large parcel of land that conceivably you could get an easement to drill a well. And so, yes, that should not have read municipally owned it should have read feasibly privately owned land or something of that nature yes, yes question there where is all this water coming is it surface water that's percolating mm -hmm. is yeah it's dropping down or is it water that's percolating up from underneath the ocean no yeah so, so the question was where where is the water yeah, so the question is, where is the water coming from in the first place? Yeah, so rainwater is going to be your main your main source ultimately. So the rainwater falls on the island. It either falls if it's if it's a lucky raindrop, it falls directly into one of those bedrock exposed bedrock fissures that I talked about, and, and ends up in the bedrock aquifer. More likely, it hits um, some of that thin layer of glacial till that I talked about, and slowly makes its way through there when it runs out of glacial till, which again, that's probably between a few feet, well, it's between zero feet and maybe you know 10 feet, 15 feet, whatever on the island, um, it will hit the bedrock and it will find its way into one of these little, these little cracks essentially mm -hmm. in the bedrock and then makes its way to the, basically down to the depths of the bedrock aquifer until it will hit either an area of bedrock that's just so compacted that there's nowhere for the water to go, or it would hit that seawater interface, that freshwater lens basically which is what we talked about um, earlier in one of these earlier slides and i'll show you this will be helpful so the water actually falls on the surface and this location in particular for example would make its way down and so it would hit about here and because fresh water is less dense than salt water it's actually going to float essentially on the salt water and then it's going to create this this lens just by like the weight of the fresh water essentially it creates this this curve um, structure. So it's rainwater. The, the short answer is rainwater. So basically, yeah. Because yeah. um, I had always thought you were a single source aquifer. Does that have a water supply from up over the island? Or is there anything coming from anything else? Yeah. Well, I mean, so. 12 miles away. Yeah. Well, I'll go back to, um, I'll go back to this graphic and sorry to the people online. I'm flying through slides here, but um, going back to this graphic here, uh, so you can see the bedrock on either side. So water, so imagine this bedrock extends, you know, up up here, follows the topography of, of the island, basically. Mm -hmm. Water that falls as rain onto the bedrock makes its way through the through the fissures. Some of it goes straight down to that saltwater interface I talked about. Some of it actually makes its way over into the sand and does recharge the aquifer. So they are they are connected. Mm -hmm. I think single source. Um, maybe is more relevant from the from the context of you, if you're withdrawing water predominantly from one aquifer and let, let, let's say there was a contamination event in that aquifer, 
it would be a problem because your water supply is coming predominantly from a single source. But as far as how they're linked together hydraulically, hydrologically, um, you know, they're they're interconnected in many in many ways. So ultimately, it starts as rainwater. It hits the ground surface. It makes its way either into the bedrock, into the meadow, or runs off right into the ocean in some cases. So. And what would be the advantage of uh, having the wells up on the belt? The, the advantage of having the wells would be that, uh, and actually it's a really good question. Um, so the question was, what is the advantage of having uh, wells as opposed to just, you know, say we're drawing from uh, the sand and gravel in the meadow. The advantage is that the bedrock um, stores water. It stores water slowly, but it also, um, it keeps water. There's a lot of water accumulating there. It, it's a very steady water supply. So if you had a drought year, for example, Typically, the bedrock aquifer is, is, is the last aquifer to be affected. It's very rare that you hear of a bedrock well drying up because of a, a dry summer if it's if it's drilled adequately deeply. Again, it's not a rule, but that's a trend that we see. Um, so and another uh, advantage is that it's it's less susceptible to certain contamination um, issues. Not again, not always. It's just it creates a separate aquifer that you can withdraw water from that separate, you know, it's, mm -hmm. again, moving away from a single source, basically. So there is an argument to be made that having drilled in the meadow and then focusing on the new well up at the top of the hill are diversifying your source. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that that's good. Uh, so that's part well, of the allure of making that Making that happen. Yes. Yeah. The comment was was that uh, drilling wells effectively is diversifying the the sources of supply. And yeah, I would agree for sure. That's exactly what the what the intention is. And I mean, the, the, the associates many years ago, I have a feeling it might get back to this niche. Is that uh, you know there was talk, serious talk about well, we've got this natural depression that kind of comes through the middle of the island and. A lot of it winds up in the ice pond, and we need to tap that. But it, was that basically this ditch theory? Yes. When the note that last summer the ice pond dried up, mm -hmm. yeah. there was less than a foot of water in the ice pond patch, mm -hmm. and all the wildlife just escaped. Right. So that's not a diverse, it's not a viable diversifier like perhaps the meadow and, and the hill. Yeah, I would argue, and so that's predominantly surface water that they were trying to against us. So yeah, so surface water on an island of this size, and especially with the, you know, the, um, I just don't think using a surface water supply is is necessarily helpful in this case, because surface water supplies are very susceptible to contamination. You need a different level of treatment usually. You need to Really, uh, chlorination is a must usually in surface water supplies. We're in groundwater. There are plenty of groundwater supplies that aren't cl uh, chlorinated at all. You don't need the chlorination. Um, you know, it's it's often helpful and it's often required by legislative bodies or state agencies, whatever. But it's uh, a surface water source would need a different level of management and scrutiny. So, Claire, are there any questions online? I'm just asking them now. Yes. Um, maybe I just said you said it, but for the um, equation that you mentioned yeah. and the, the one to 40, mm -hmm. how deep? Um, oh, yeah. What's the calculation for how high the water is above sea level and then how yeah. high? Yeah, so essentially, and I'll go, so the question was, um, for the gavin herzberg equation, um, the, the 40 to 1 ratio, how did we kind of come up with that? And let me go back to that slide. Um, so here's an example. Um, so imagine we had a well um, that was um, right above this, this seat here for the people that are watching online. Um, and the well uh, descends down, let's just say the well is 100 feet deep, to make it easy. And the top of the well also to make it easy is, um, I don't know, 50 feet above sea level. And we measured the water from the top of the well down and it was 
twenty five. We'll say, well, well, whatever. Let's let's you know, thirty feet. We'll say, right. So that means there's twenty feet of water above sea level, and then we take that twenty feet and multiply it by forty, and you'd have. Is that what you found? Twenty feet. I don't. That's why I'm asking. Or is it five feet? It was it was variable. It was variable. It, it followed this trend. So in the center of the island, just to give you some numbers, we calculated thousand three to four thousand feet of fresh below. water set below sea level. Uh -huh. Where in a, near the shoreline, some of the wells we thought were a little bit more vulnerable. Yeah. Um, that freshwater lens only extended about 150 to 200 feet below. And so, if you have a well that's uh, 500 feet deep, it's potentially poking right through that freshwater lens into the salt. So you actually, you if there's such thing as over drilling a well, you can drill you can drill a well right through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why I think we were talking about yes. we were talking about focusing up here on on the higher elevation. I mean, it, it sounds like a, a kind of a cop out. It's like, well, of course you want to drill on the high elevations, but but you know, there's no risk of drilling through the freshwater lens when you're with a with a drill that because you mentioned two to five hundred foot or something yeah. like that uh, length. Um, yeah. So it would be two to five hundred feet of well below the from the surface yeah. of the island or from that from the surface of the island. In the oh, surface. Yeah, yeah. That's a typical, that's just a, again, typical. There's some wells that are, are, are more or less, but. But for our purposes. Yeah. Here, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Can we take one more question? And do you have a last slide? Do I have a last slide? Mm -hmm. No, I guess we never really did. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, so just just a, a summary, some takeaways. So again, um, takeaway one, groundwater hydraulic modeling indicated that as it sits right now, the meadow is not uh, likely to be impacted by saltwater intrusion from beneath the ground. However, there is some risk from sea level rise of water overtopping into the meadow more frequently. That would need to be studied further to be better quantified. The second, uh, conclusion that we kind of drew from this limited data was that the bedrock wells uh, don't seem to be impacted by saltwater intrusion at this time. The bedrock wells that we sampled, we didn't sample all of them. The Gavin Herzberg lens estimated that the freshwater lens was typically plenty deep to accommodate the wells. However, there were a couple of locations closest to the shoreline where it was marginal, it was close. So there could be a couple of wells that that might uh, see some issues in the future, potentially, but maybe not. Um, and then thirdly, uh, or thirdly, we found some potential well locations up on Lighthouse Hill that could be future supply sources that could augment the, the meadow aquifer. And then, you know, I kind of just feel like the largest challenges on this island really are just selecting well locations that, you know, one, maintain setbacks, but two, aren't incredibly inconvenient and expensive to tie into the existing system. So, um, you know, it sounds like others have have looked into some of these locations as well. And, and it does seem like there is some some talk of, you know, potentially just a matter of, um, of getting drillers out here, which I hear is, is difficult to. Uh, so I have one question yeah. here. How does the information you've shared, oh, connect to the plantations plan for revamping the water system. That's one question. Okay. And the other is, I assume the bedrock wells recommended are for seasonal use because the water pipes from there are above ground, or am I missing something? Yeah, so I I, I, I see some head shaking from the crowd that the uh, water system <laughs> is potentially uh, looking at seasonal use uh, for the foreseeable future, but you could always adapt bedrock wells to full-time year-round use in the future. It doesn't change the well, it just it changes the way that the well is connected. You could have a distribution system underground in the future if you so chose and use the same wells. You could even use the meadow. Honestly, you could adapt the meadow for that use too. You mentioned trenches and that would make it year-round. Yeah. How deep is it? Usually four feet below the surface. Four feet? Four, yeah. 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 Sorry, another another okay. detail I glossed over. No, but... I was just two or three inches. Yeah, yeah, no, it would have to be several, no. at least four feet, maybe more, maybe more in Maine, honestly. I don't and then how does the information you've shared connect to the plantation's plans for revamping the water system? Um, right. So I'm not sure exactly what 
plans they're referring to. Um, if, if I don't know if there's like a comprehensive plan. Yeah, I mean, do you? Um, well, can I just call in? Yeah. This study is where the conversation about wells came from. Mm -hmm. This study in this yeah. that's the connection is that this, this was called the alternative water supply feasibility study. From, and from the study, conversation is that about the future wells are. Right. So the answer is, so the answer to that that question is kind of that this study led to a, a kind of a conversation about um, future well drilling and you know it's it's part of that the, the data collected is is a big part of that conversation so um, yeah I'm not sure how much more I can answer it specifically but yeah it's it's uh, it's a another way to diversify the water system so yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone online. Thank you very much for um, supporting our ecology series. This is the last one of the season. It was an amazing one. Thank you both. And um, if you could all help carry out chairs, we have to put them all away in the shed next door. Thank you. Thank you, right. Thank you everyone.